what does it mean to be proven? Wow. <laughs> People come to me and say, uh, well, there's no proof to support that. There are a lot of skeptics out there. That say complementary alternative medicine of any stripe, including functional medicine, is all quackery. I hate the word alternative because I'm as mainstream as they get. It makes it seem like we're on the fringe and I'm like, no. It's really just great medicine with more tools. What is proof, okay? What is truth? Who do you trust? These are like the biggest questions of our time when it comes to health. As a scientist, I mean, I always, when I find something, I want to find the evidence. So I had a lot more ego, you know, when I first graduated and I, I know I was a doctor and I had authority. And so unfortunately, we still look up to this authority for all the answers. We don't look at traditional medicine as much here. We don't, we don't look at these these people who are telling us I had stage four cancer and I went into remission naturally. We all say that's rare, that's it's not common, it's unlikely. And I've seen family members this has happened to and the doctors saying that, you know, maybe it was a misdiagnosis. And so I think eventually when your ego leaves, you, you can actually see what is, what is true. And now I'm finding how little I actually do know and how much more wisdom there is in ancient things that people would tell me. Now I'm finding out, wow, there's actually science coming up with this, that it's true. And so in 20 years, we'll probably find out things that our grandparents told us that I used to roll my eyes and say, well, that was a myth, you know? So I think clinical evidence is huge. So I, I find it funny because there's nothing alternative about it. It's why originally medicine was created, it's why doctors go into medicine, and it's using all the things at our disposal, and not just the medications and the surgery, but we're using nutrients to drive processes, we're using genetics, we're using metabolic processes, we're using food, which was the medicine they had years and years and years ago anyway. So we're just having a larger toolbox and really it's, a, it's as science-based as it gets. A lot of the personalized medicine and a lot of the biohacking that like people are really digging into is the end result of people being like, well, I was told that this thing would work for me, but then I went and I tried it and it didn't work. So why didn't it work for me? You have to ask, ask yourself, okay, drug companies, why don't drugs work for everybody? You have to understand there's major economic forces at work here. You know, we have these pharmaceutical companies that stand to lose a lot if you come out with a study that says, let's say, fish oil helps depression. What are you going to do if you're making a lot of money selling a drug like Prozac? Who funds the training programs for the doctors? Who funds the FDA? The drug companies fund the FDA. Most people don't know that. The FDA depends on money directly contributed by the drug companies. So the FDA is not going to be really uh, interested if you assert that something like fish oil is helpful for depression, even though there's very good data on that. And, and I've seen it work in my patients. So any doctor that's keeping up with the research now is realizing that personalized medicine, individualized medicine, precision medicine, whatever you want to call it, that that is the future. And that individualized medicine, personalized medicine, can very easily encompass you know, what we've called alternative treatments in the past. Because the important thing is getting the person better. An example I would use is say you got a mom that's had migraines since you were a kid. Mom's got a migraine, she disappears, things turn sour, it's bad. Mom's tried everything. Then mom goes and tries something new and comes back and her migraine's gone. You're like, come on. No, it's gone. Now, in that isolated case, that worked for mom. But to you, now that thing, whatever that was, worked, right? And that, to you, is proven, right? Now, that's an N of one, and that may not work for you or anyone else, right? But to you, wow, acupuncture, whatever it was, worked for my mom. 
And I've had grumpy old guys that couldn't believe in anything and I asked them not to believe in it. I said, look, you're here for the experience. Either this thing reduces your pain or not. I'm not asking you to believe anything. This isn't woo woo magic. You tell me how your back feels. And if he walks out of there and it works, now not only is he a believer, his wife's a believer, right? And that will continue to stack up. And those data points also become evidence. So learn from the data because it's helpful. Because it gives us guidance and context and understanding and, and shifts the odds in our favor. But also learn from your own body, your own life experience, depending on your health history, your metabolism, your life stage. Bring your precious loving attention to your body. Not the, the mean kind of, why are you doing that and what's wrong with you? Stop thinking that your body is a problem to fix and start thinking that it is a miracle to discover and you will reap tremendous benefits. Hi, and welcome to Proven, healing breakthroughs backed by science. My name is Nick Polizzi, and I'm gonna be your host for the next nine episodes. Each day, we will be diving into a specific illness or health condition and exploring the powerful complementary and alternative medicines that have undeniable scientific evidence showing that they work. You'll meet a number of the world's leading voices when it comes to health and wellness, from traditional healers, herbalists, nutritionists, and naturopaths, to leading scientists, researchers, and pioneering doctors. These remarkable individuals come from a variety of backgrounds, but they all agree on one thing. There is an entire realm of human health that the masses are largely unaware of. And I'll let you in on a little secret. It all starts with opening up to the possibility that there are more healing solutions out there than you can possibly imagine once we start broadening our horizons. When it comes to emergencies, there is nothing better than modern medicine. In fact, it was initially called heroic medicine, and to this day, it still shines in that regard. On a personal note, my oldest son, River, wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the brilliant and tireless caregivers at the hospital down the road. Heroic medicine indeed. The problem is that 90% of the health challenges we face are chronic conditions, meaning these are health issues that develop slowly over time, are often caused by lifestyle, and are not helped most often by drugs and surgery. Modern medicine can try to control them for a little while and often with undesirable side effects, but it doesn't usually have an actual solution. Now, the problem with modern medicine is that it's focused on symptom treatment. It's not focused on the underlying causes. There's no money in prevention. And our system is largely driven to some degree by financial concerns and greed. So we're talking about the majority of symptom treatment as pharmaceuticals or surgeries. Now, you can't treat an epidemic of lifestyle disease by treating the symptoms. It's not gonna work. It's just a system that doesn't support figuring out why. It's a system that just says, oh, you don't have anything terribly wrong with you and I'm not gonna look for anything else. I'm not in a system to do that for you. Did you know that over 80% of the money we spend on healthcare in the Western world is to treat a chronic illness? And three in four people will die of a chronic illness that is preventable. What if you could repair and revitalize your entire body using safe and natural methods that have stacks of science showing they work? William James Mayo, the founder of the Mayo Clinic, once said, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease and prolong life. The ideal of medicine is to eliminate the need for a physician. That is where we're going in proven, healing breakthroughs backed by science. We think that we have to outsource all of our care, but this is not true. The common misconception is that we want people to be reliant on us as medical providers, healthcare providers. Uh, we don't. We don't want you to come in. We want you to be able to figure out ways to take care of yourself better. And that is always our goal. If we as healthcare providers can empower you to understand how to take care of your health and want to do it on a regular basis without relying on us, it's the biggest win that we could ever have. What you're about to see over the next nine episodes is the missing piece to healing your body. Therapies, natural medicines, personal practices, and daily habits that have all been proven effective. These medicines have been labeled alternative, even though they often have just as many studies showing their benefits as modern medicine does, and oftentimes even more. 
Each of the upcoming episodes will cover a specific health challenge and feature five solutions for it. These alternative medicines and therapies, many of which you can do at home right now, have been vetted by researchers and are being featured because they are A, backed by science, B, easy to access, and C, are absolutely safe. We'll not only be talking about the proven breakthroughs for these disorders, but we'll also be going into some hidden root causes that you might not be aware of, as well as other empowering pieces of information for taking back control of your health and helping your friends and family do the same. In this opening episode, we'll begin with an underlying condition that many say is the root cause of chronic disease. It's something that affects every single one of us in some way, especially in the times we're currently living in right now. I'm talking about stress. And while this may seem like a harmless aspect of our human existence, the science is conclusive that unmanaged stress is often the first domino that falls, creating a chain reaction of internal complications that can lead to serious health conditions. Plus, we're here to enjoy this life, to be our highest self, to inspire and be inspired by others. Stress, while helpful in small doses, limits us in so many ways when left unchecked. To prepare your mind and body for the upcoming episodes, let's start by releasing the stress and tension so we can fully absorb what's to come. The World Health Organization recently said that stress is the epidemic of the 21st century. And I think we all know it in some ways. We know we're stressed, we're moving fast. Uh, I'm not quite sure we recognize just how stressed we are. The reality is that when you are stressed, when you're running around, that can become your new normal. So you can have this set point of, okay, this is, I'm this stressed all the time. That's gonna start feeling normal. For someone like me, prior to meditation, I was in the fitness industry. And so I thought, man, I've got wellness down. I work out, I do yoga, I hike, I eat organic, but I still felt a massive amount of stress. I still wasn't able to sleep. I was only sleeping three hours every night. I was color coding and labeling everything in my house and putting things in order because I didn't know what to do with my energy. Drama from a thousand miles away would just hit me like a bomb and then it would rock my world for days, maybe even a week of what was happening in other people's lives that then affected my nervous system. And so what would happen is my nervous system would go into fight or flight. And for me, most of the time it was, I'm fleeing, I'm staying home, I can't deal, I'm depressed. I just, I can't deal with what's happening in this outside world. Stress is fundamentally rooted in the core of our nervous system, which is two parts. One of them is the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight, flight, or freeze response. That's a system that's engaged when we are running from a lion or we're in an immediate situation of survival threat that might lead to our demise. Your cortex sees the tiger. The stress centers in your brain go up. You can run away from the tiger. Your heart rate goes up. Digestion, you don't need to digest your food. You got 20 minutes to live. Why would you digest your food? So stomach acid goes down, pancreatic enzymes go down, Everything goes haywire, and the immune system gets super jacked up. In the short term, when we are running from a lion, you want all the blood to go to your motor cortex and your skeletal muscles and the, your fear response in your brain to get you out of that situation as quickly as possible. That's the good part of stress. Well, that's fine for 20 minutes, but what if the threat is your boss or your wife or your checking account? Emails pings, slack, your kids screaming, all of these things create the sense in our bodies that we are running from a lion all the time. Cortisol is known as the longevity hormone. We know it as stress hormone. Cortisol can affect every single aspect when it's mood related, when it's energy related, sleep related, weight related. So many people complain of that belly weight. And I often say that's, that's stress. You're not in that rest and parasympathetic mode of digestion. So your body says, you know what, we, we're in flight or flight still, so let's just store this as fat for future survival in case we need it. So I was very interested to look at the research behind stress and what helps stress, because we keep hearing that stress is the root cause of all diseases. So why aren't we as doctors trained more on how to help patients with stress? Okay, are you ready for our first proven stress solution? 
Remember, we're arranging the healing breakthroughs in a countdown format starting with number five and ending with number one. The ranking for each is based on scientific evidence, history of use, ease of access, and a few other key factors. With that said, our first solution is a practice that is literally thousands of years old. 30 years ago, most of us didn't know this technique existed, but now you can find a class in every major city and town in the Western world. I'm talking about yoga, and the science now shows that this conscious movement method in its many different shapes and sizes is making a huge impact on the world of health and wellness. Let's dive in. Yoga comes from India the ancient knowledge of India. Westerners have only known yoga as a physical activity, and that was actually never what it was meant to be. Yoga is a system. It's a system of understanding the integration of the wisdom of life. Now, most of the yoga research is sort of incorporating the four major components of what you see and experience in a yoga class. So obviously in the first case, there's the postures and the exercises. Everybody knows that. In fact, that's what most people think yoga is. It's just a form of exercise. But traditional yoga also incorporates so-called pranayama, the breathing practices, and there's a variety of different breathing practices. The most important um, and very powerful one is long, slow, deep breathing. Then there's a deep relaxation component, which is very important in yoga practices. And then finally, perhaps the most important component of yoga practice is the contemplative component, the meditative component, the focus of attention. Now people can do more than that. They can adopt what we call a yoga lifestyle. There's a diet that you, many people adopt. You can live in a, in a group or a community that practices yoga. But most of the research is really done on those four components. I would say in the last decade, there has been this explosion of research all of a sudden about yoga and yoga specifically for depression and mood disorders. And I think this is because all of a sudden yoga is trending in the general public, you know, as a really effective way to lift your mood and actually to achieve some sense of emotional wellness. And so because of the general public using it so much and having all of these anecdotal reports in the literature about this, suddenly in the last uh, 10, 15 years, there's been this explosion of data. The public interest in yoga is sort of like driving the science to actually investigate it more. The research is critical. The medical system will not implement this wholesale until there's sufficient evidence that makes it possible for a policymaker, someone who designs the, the medical school curriculum, to then say, we need to teach this to our medical students as an option. In the United States, the first group that got really um, scrutinized in terms of yoga as a treatment for depression was um, peripartum and postpartum women, because this was a group um, that was very reluctant to take antidepressant medication. Most all of these studies were looking at yoga as a complementary therapy, meaning it was an add-on therapy to usual care. And so usual care for a lot of these pregnant women, because they didn't want any depressant medication, might be talk therapy or some kind of a group therapy. And so uh, yoga was sort of like added on to those uh, usual prenatal care that they were going through. Um, but no one seemed to have uh, quite the um, confidence perhaps in yoga to look at it as a monotherapy for major depression. So being the only intervention. Now, um, I, when I had gone to India and I'd gone to Bangalore, working with these researchers there, they were very confident about yoga. They were looking at yoga as a monotherapy there. They actually were using yoga as the only treatment, having observed that patients were able to tolerate that, that the depression scores did not go down, did not plummet. Uh, people weren't becoming acutely suicidal as a result of, you know, not getting conventional care for that period of time. Uh, I felt like I, I felt like I did have the confidence to actually try a monotherapy trial. You know, I felt like there was a basis for it. The, um, the average number of people, I think, in our study uh, were like something like had two previous trials of antidepressant medication and had not gotten better from it. They also almost all had had some exposure to psychotherapy and had not gotten better. better. Uh, and we also made sure that they were not currently on any any sort of conventional care, because if we were gonna study the effects of yoga, we wanted to make sure that we weren't in effect studying um, you know, it as a complementary treatment. So we really were careful to select a population that we could really say we're not getting any treatment. So all of that being said, what we ended up with was a population that is essentially considered to be a treatment resistant 
depressed population. And we put uh, one group into a eight week program receiving group yoga treatment. And the group yoga treatment was basically an, uh, 90 minutes, two times a week of um, yoga uh, asanas, breathing exercises, and then a closing relaxation practice. And then we looked at the outcomes in terms of depression in the two groups. And uh, we were uh, surprised to see that actually the group that had gone through the yoga had a significantly um, improved scores on their depression and not only significantly improved but actually their likelihood of remitting which means having no sign of depression was actually much higher than those that were in the control group um, so significantly higher and uh, we did not expect that we thought that there might be some improvement in depression scores but we didn't think that they would actually remit because remember these were the people that were treatment resistant now we have as human beings, we have a mind-body interface. So when you manipulate the body and change the body, you change mental state as well. We're just starting to understand some of the research in that area. And that comes from the stretching. Uh, it comes from the balance. It comes from the breath regulation. There's direct effects of breath regulation on the autonomic nervous system, which is involved in the stress and emotion response. So that's directly affecting mood. And what you see at the end of the yoga class is a reduction in tension physical tension, and then mentally you feel much lighter because you've downregulated the stress response. We're creating neurotransmitters every time we meditate, and I always like to say we create a bliss cocktail. It's like our little happy hour. And so what we create in that is these neurotransmitters. We create dopamine, and dopamine is what makes us feel good. It takes the edge off. It's the mood enhancer. We create endorphins, and endorphins help relieve the pain in the body and they give us energy. We create GABA and GABA brings tranquility and it brings calmness and that peacefulness to us. There's studies that show that after a single yoga class, a neurotransmitter called GABA, which is a well-known inhibitory neurotransmitter that's associated with mood state, increases. We create serotonin, and serotonin helps with sleep. It helps with appetite. It levels appetite. So if we're under eating or we're overeating, it helps with that, and it also increases happiness. So those of us that have anxiety, uh, we have depression, we have hopelessness and suicidal thinking. When we're able to go within meditation and and experience the balancing through the natural chemistry and time, I have students a year year and a half of regular meditation and me working with their psychiatrist, they can wean off the medications. And the medications then are irrelevant because they're creating and sustaining their own chemistry themselves. You're not even aware how stressed you are. Most people are walking around with their shoulders up to their ears in chronic stress. Their brow is furrowed all the time and they're walking around like this. They're not even aware of the tension they're holding in their bodies. It's one of the first things you learn in your first yoga class. Pay attention to your body. Do your shoulder shrugs. Become aware of your shoulders. Let them relax. Notice this over the course of the day. Be mindful of what's happening with you. Focus your attention. Notice that your thoughts are just thoughts. Don't react to those thoughts. Engage them, but notice that they're just thoughts. That's, my, that's the metacognition component. And in fact, Harvard Medical School itself has recognized the importance of that. And just this last year, they implemented a mandatory resiliency training program for all first-year incoming medical students. I taught about four different sessions with about 15 medical students, giving them a talk about yoga. So this is something that is, I think, coming uh, in terms of uh, implementation in, in, in modern medicine. So the ancient yogis from India knew a thing or two. And get this, they figured it all out by experimenting these movements and thought processes on themselves, which is something that we see a lot in proven ancient medicines. Okay, are you ready for what's next? In the upcoming segment, we'll be exploring some extremely promising and yes, proven herbs and supplements for both stress and related mood disorders, specifically anxiety and depression. It may be news to many that something like depression and stress could be intimately related, but the studies show that prolonged large amounts of stress can lead to both minor and major mood imbalances. So what can we do about it? Let's find out.
People often ask about herbal medicine and research because the common belief is, is that there is no research. Well, first off, that's not true. There's a great deal of research. Part of the problem is most of the research is not done in the United States because what, who does most of the research in the United States? Pharmaceutical companies. And pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in herbal products because they can't patent them, or at least not easily. And so therefore, there's just not enough money involved. So ashwagandha is one of the nine well-researched adaptogens. And ashwagandha is a traditional herb used in Ayurveda and Siddha medicine. Siddha medicine is the traditional medicine of southern India and Sri Lanka, and fairly similar to Ayurveda. Ashwagandha, over the past maybe five years, has all of a sudden become incredibly popular. It is a calming adaptogen, and as a calming adaptogen, there are studies showing that it reduces anxiety. Um, so I use it a lot for people who are basically really stressed out and, as a result, become anxious. It helps reduce cortisol levels. But it also, interestingly enough, was helpful with weight. And the reason that it helped weight is it increased feelings of satiety, meaning people felt full, but it also decreased stress-induced eating. It also reduced BMI, it reduced overall body weight. And so is it the key if you know somebody is, you know, seriously overweight, is it gonna make you become slim? No, but it is something especially for people who find themselves when they get stressed out, feeling like they need to eat, it could be a very useful component to their diet protocol. Reishi is, is the mushroom you start with. If you're in doubt, it's also known as the queen of all mushrooms. It is the most studied uh, functional mushroom, even ahead of shiitake. Um, it has a um, long culture use globally, but um, the longest documented use is a little over 2,000 years from China, partly because they were just better at documenting at that time than many others. And in the original Materia Medica, which is like the Bible for traditional Chinese medicine, out of all the herbs that they listed, because they thought mushrooms were herbs back then, um, all the herbs listed, Rishi was listed as the most nutrient dense food. This is more adaptogenic, and which is a th word thrown out a lot, but it means that it has this ability to help body to adapt to stressors. So most common use of reishi mushroom is calming the body. There is blood pressure, cholesterol markers that often gets measured on like, if the body's calm, there's many body functions that you can observe. Today, you can obviously track your sleep. So that's a common way how people test HRV, deep sleep, REM sleep, and the impacts of those. Before we started the sleep tracking, we used to track things like blood pressure, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, things like that. So Rishi has pretty much an impact on all of them. So if you start looking at data, um, you can start notice how Rishi positively kind of calms your body. It's not a sedative in the way that let's say Valeriana is. It is an adaptogen, so you could take it in the morning and afternoon, but the most common powerful use of Rishi mushroom is probably um, in the evening as a way to kind of prepare your body for the night. It also does these um, hippoprotective elements for the liver. It does help with allergies. So there are studies on being antihistaminic. Um, there are even studies that it helps with HIV, which is mind blowing. Um, so I highly recommend looking into conodermic acid and reishi mushroom for benefits. Um, the other compound that are found in these um, top mushrooms such as reishi's triterpenes. So terpenes are obviously now a hot thing. Uh, partly because of marijuana um, and the terpenes is like a family, same as polysaccharides. These are not the same terpenes you find in marijuana. These are these triterpenes, so the structure is slightly different. But what is pretty similar is like <clears throat> from an um, anecdotal effect is that their ability to calm the body and like relax the body seems to be quite, quite like a similar effect that you get out of these triterpenes. And um, so, yeah. Ganodermic acid, triterpenes, and polysaccharides are the most common active compounds found in these, these mushrooms. What's proven is this type of thinking, Chinese medicine or whatever modality you're talking about, over the test of time has shown that it treats anxiety well. In my clinic, I have extreme success with it, but I don't have a formula. I don't have something that, that, you, that I can just say, hey, go buy this on Amazon and, and you're going to feel better. 
Um, some of those strategies, um, like in functional medicine, taking GABA or theanine or something like that, calm the nervous system. You know, it, it creates GABA in the brain. And if you're deficient in GABA in the brain, which a lot of people are when they're stressed, then yes, they will feel better. But again, why is it happening? What in their life is out of balance that creates their, their neurotransmitters in their brain of GABA being deficient? What are they out of balance with reality? And this is where it really starts to get interesting because people are fundamentally creating that themselves. And so when they start to see through maybe the lens of Chinese medicine, how they're interacting with life that's creating that, then they can start to see how they can uproot the problem you know, from, from the core and then just not have that anymore or have a strategy that they can themselves implement without taking something. Ultimately, anxiety is part of the human condition. Either we're really suppressing it or we're dealing with it on some level. So every, every human pretty much has some bit of this, in my opinion. And we have all sorts of coping mechanisms. So what do we do with that? Well, in my opinion, we start to learn to be more and more present with it. The more present we can be with something like anxiety, the more that it's not a problem. And we can start to understand why, it, why it's manifesting us. What is it showing us about ourselves? Up next is an area of internal mastery that has become a buzzword lately. If you look on PubMed, one of the premier medical research databases, among the most well-studied and proven ways to release stress and related mood disorders is mindfulness. What is mindfulness? It's the practice of bringing your full awareness to the present moment using practices like meditation. It might seem woo-woo or spiritual, but millions of people are realizing that this state of consciousness is actually a core part of being alive that most of us are depriving ourselves of and the science from the major medical institutions agrees. So what's the best way to do it, and how does mindfulness work to dissolve stress and upgrade your mind? We're about to find out. Mindfulness has changed my life, and I don't like the term because it says mindful, but the whole point is for your mind not to be full and for you to be so aware in the moment without judgment, that's key. So often what I found I was doing is I was very self-aware from a young age. I started meditating and I was sort of uh, almost too aware of my thoughts. And what would happen is you have another thought following the thought about the thought that you just had. And this excessive thinking I learned in medicine, it can actually deplete nutrients. It actually depletes minerals and can weaken your digestive system. So I was very interested to look at the research behind stress and what helps stress because we keep hearing that stress is the root cause of all diseases. So why aren't we as doctors trained more on how to help patients with stress? And I always thought we had to manage stress. We had to get rid of stress. The stress was bad. And little did I know that demonizing stress or even that word itself is what is doing the harm. So. I encourage everyone to look, listen to the TED Talk, How to Become Friends with Your Stress, because the research in there shows that the people that perceive stress to be bad, the people who think stress is bad, that's actually when stress is bad. So again, it shows you that what you believe is more important than the actual thought you're having. And so I looked up in PubMed what has been researched to help stress the most, and I came across Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. And I saw that they have these programs all over the world. And this is not something that any doctor ever gets taught in school, and I, I certainly wasn't. So I took on my first MBSR class, which literally was difficult because I couldn't be that still. And every time they would tell us, for example, to do a body scan. So just to learn to scan your body and see where you're holding tension, are you even feeling your feet? It's just becoming very aware of your body. It's bringing you to the now, bringing you aware of your breath, of the sensations, the sounds around you. And it was very, very helpful because I couldn't sit down and meditate. I wasn't that kind of person that could just sit there for half an hour and do nothing. And so for me, I learned to you know, wash the dishes while being mindful, speak to someone while being mindful, have a, a workout and be mindful and be in the moment. And then came across mindfulness, self-compassion. I would say if there's any class I recommend to every single patient, it's that because it changed my life. 
And I, I wish every teenager, every 12-year-old, every 10-year-old gets taught how to be more compassionate and loving and kind towards themselves. Because we are taught so much about how to be with other people and how to give, but so much of our own sufferings and patterns and disease comes from the way we speak to ourselves, the way we handle our own thoughts, our own failures, our mistakes. And this just changed my life because I started seeing the little girl in me and witnessing her and understanding her more and being so kind and loving that that's all I needed. And it filled my cup up and I was a better doctor, a better mother, a better partner because now I had me as my backup. I, the universe, I always looked outside for validation or for love or for, for praise for so many things and I realized everything I needed was in me. One of the practices that I still do from that class is daily telling myself, looking at myself in the mirror and saying, may you be loved. And this was difficult for me to do, so I encourage patients to do this, or if you're watching this, you can do this exercise where think of someone who you love, who you just, every time you're around them, they make you so happy and so joyful. For me, it was my little niece. She's two, three years old now, and anytime you're around a kid like that, usually they just light you up, like you're just so happy. And so I pictured her sitting there and I wished for her an easy life, a happy life, a healthy life, a, ever, all her dreams come true. It was easy, I realized, for me to say all those things to her. Then the exercises, I go sit beside her and then I say all those things as we. May we have love, may we find success, may we have health, and then the exercise is she moves and it's just me and now I have to say this for myself. And usually in the class when you're doing this, everyone starts to cry and everyone is very emotional because you realize what happened to that little child that you were so kind to or that had all these hopes and dreams as a two-year-old, as a five-year-old and a six-year-old and now there's the adult self, you know, that's kind of taken over. And uh, it, it was just beautiful. It's a beautiful meditation using imagery. They're teaching it all over the United States and all over the world. And take, take part in it. It will change your life. It, it will help you be a better human being by starting with yourself. I remember, I remember 20 years ago when I started this mindfulness journey. And we, we went to groups and organizations and we told them we have this incredible practice. It's called mindfulness and this is what it's all about. And usually we would get this suspicious look and uh, a rejection. My friends, my colleagues used to say to me, it's you're obviously very passionate about this thing, about this mindfulness, but you know, we love you and we want you to have a successful career. Change topic. This will take you nowhere. And then came science, right? And it's, it's I find it amazing how Rigorous, high-quality science can change everything when it comes to a, an intervention, in this, case, in this case, mindfulness. Because when you look at the 80s and the 90s, we had almost nothing. We had very, very few studies, even fewer clinical trials. So we knew very little about mindfulness back then. And then around the year 2000, boom, an explosion. And the number of studies around mindfulness well-researched, you know, RCTs, randomly controlled trials, everything grew and got to a point where we now have hundreds and hundreds of studies per year. We have many thousands of studies around mindfulness. Mindfulness became the most popular psychological intervention we have, which is, again, it, if we think about the, the, the period of time, only 20 years, it's, it's amazing. Mental health is not the lack of mental illness. It's much more than that. In order for us to experience mental health, we need to have those additional components of healthier relationship with ourselves and, and, and with other people, right? Hope and gratitude and, and personal meaning uh, and, and, and greater happiness, uh, satisfaction, compassion, and mindfulness is very helpful with those as well. Let's make it practical. So I was in the, the playground with my daughter um, a few months ago, and she was going down the slide. And when she went down the slide and got to the bottom of the slide, she fell over. She hit her nose on the floor and she started bleeding. Um, I was a short distance away from her, and I could feel 
in my body the reaction, the automatic reaction, the one that has no presence or awareness. It's the autopilot kicking in, wanting me to run there hysterically, picking her up and asking, are you okay? Right? With that vibe of, of, of anxiety. But I, I've been practicing for a very, very long time. So as I was noticing this, this wave of, of, of reaction, I also realized, wait, pause. This is not the healthy choice here. And you have a choice. And I choose to quickly approach her, but do it peacefully and pick her up very quickly and hug her. But again, very peacefully, no drama, right? And what a huge difference in my experience of that event and her experience of that event, because she picks up on my vibe, right? And that's something, that's, that's a qualitative change in my attention, right? I am able to work with the moment, accept the moment, not add the, the, the automatic, judgmental, uh, reactive piece, and it transforms everything. And this is just a, a simple example from my everyday life. You could apply this to anything, right? Experiences of work, experiences with your spouse, experiences with your children, experiences with yourself, any moment that is highly relevant. Do you have the capacity to pause and make a healthy choice? And this is, this is an, another really important point. We, we think about the practice of mindfulness in a kind of black and white approach, right? So I, either I'm fully present 24 hours, seven days a week, or I don't do this thing, right? But that's, it's, 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 it's an unhelpful, unrealistic approach to the practice. And that single mother with four kids who's juggling all those different tasks and challenges, she needs that space time to contemplate how she pays the bills and how she deals with life. She needs all that. It's important for her to be able to do that. It's about finding the right moments for that kind of practice. Okay. So for example, we found, and there's now a lot of research around relationships and the practice of mindfulness, and more specifically, um, what we call positive parenting, right? One of the most crucial factors in our relationship with our kids is the level of presence we offer them as we spend time with them. And some parents say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I, I, we spend an hour here, an hour there. They forget the fact that during that time, most, most of the time they were on their, on their mobile phone, right? While the kid was playing. That's not the, the, the interaction I'm talking about. Right? Even 20 minutes of, I'm here with you. I see you. I hear you. I communicate with you fully. Nothing else exists right now. This is presence. And the kid feels it. It's not just kids. Any relationship is, is built on that. Right? And we sit with, with, a, with a friend in, in a coffee place and they share something with us. They feel if we are there with them, truly listen, truly hear them, truly connect with them, or, you know, we're thinking about something. And we might think, how would they know? It's just in my head. It's so easy to feel when someone is present with you, right? So this is relevant to our romantic relationships, to our friendships, to our kids. The quality of relationship transforms when we are there present. And so it's all about choosing, choosing which moments are relevant for this kind of practice? When could I choose not to allow my mind to go into stories, but be really present? Because this feels, this feels meaningful. I want to be here when it happens. We were born to move. It's as simple as that. Our ancestors were moving all the time, whether we're talking about working out in the field, or even further back, hunting and gathering walking miles and miles each day to find food, and sometimes running away from dangerous predators. Our bodies haven't changed much since then and are still designed for physical activity. But in our modern world, movement has become an endangered aspect of life. We work at desks all day, sit in cars for hours during rush hour, and then crash on the couch in front of the TV. It may seem like we're advancing as a species on the outside, but on the inside, our body is pleading with us to start moving again. It's not just about staying in shape. 
Movement plays a huge role in balancing out and recalibrating our internal cycles. And one of the major internal processes that we can affect with the right movements is our sympathetic and our parasympathetic state. What are those? Sympathetic is our fight or flight response. Great for running from danger, but not something we want to be in all the time. And our parasympathetic state is our rest and digest mode, where we're in calm flow. This is where the magic happens. We want to be in parasympathetic at least 90% of the time. It's how our body restores and protects itself. It's how our brain relaxes and finds its groove. It's how we turn on the body's innate self-healing abilities. And one of the best ways to get there, that's where we're going next. So there's some science about how muscles and the way we hold our muscles can actually have this uh, effect of bringing a sense of feeling to us. So if we smile, the muscles in our face actually can help us to light up internally as well. And the same thing if we think about your posture and if you think about being hunched over, you're not able to breathe as much. Your heart rate is constricted in that way. But when we are open and more forward facing, more breath can come in, we can feel different, and if you think about it also from a social and emotional perspective, we're much more able to make connections to other people, which we do know changes our kind of chemical responses in our body. That physical interaction, that visual, the kind of the micro muscles in our face and even in our postures and gestures have so much to do with how we feel and are, are able to relate to others. The coordination of eyes, mind, body, and breath. It's been here for thousands of years. It's a central tenet of Qigong. We're barely scratching the surface of trying to understand what's happening here. The literal translation of Qigong is energy work. Energy work, what is that? So uh, there's different traditions that do it differently. There's internal energy work. You close your eyes and you visualize things happening. There's things that you, you know, times I'm staring through my hands um, and times that I'm moving, right? One of the most important factors in Qigong, uh, to me, if you're doing the external Qigong, is the coordination of eyes, mind, body, and breath. But if you do it right, something very powerful happens because the attention of the practitioner starts to turn inward. You start to retroflect. You start to have this innate capacity of being more aware of what's happening inside your body. In doing so, you can start to modulate and flip a very important switch that we could get into, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. Being able to trip that wire and go back to what we call the rest and digest ecology of the body. The sympathetic nervous system should be running one to 3% of the time. Tiger shows up, uh, once you're safe, you shake it out, you have uh, all sorts of weird fluctuations in your heart rate, your adrenals are, are just basically dumping and trying to figure out how to come back to normal. And 15, 20, 30 minutes later, maybe an hour later, you're back to normal. You're hanging out. That's not how the modern world works. We live in sympathetic dominance. And what that does is it puts us in the amygdala, a part of the brain that's designed to be reactive, designed to say, oh, what was that sound, right? And, and so that happens if they're screeching car tires in the modern jungle, that makes sense. But if the phone bill shows up and you're like, how long has my kid been texting? And you know, all your money, all your survival, all the stuff that also elicits that because we have an abstract part of our brain that will interpret things that are not necessarily life or death as stressors because they touch us on our survival, puts us into sympathetic, what happens? Blood pulls back from the digestion. Don't water the fields, send the troops to war, right? And when the boys are on the front lines, there's no money for school books, there's no money for, for arts, there's no money for healthcare, there's no money for any of it, right? So look at like this as above, so below type of metaphor. That's how we've been living. We've been in a wartime economy and our bodies start to fall apart. What happens is your secretory IgA levels in your gut start to get challenged. The microbiome starts to shift to more sugar-loving uh, bugs and bacteria, which are then more pro-inflammatory. And this whole cascade of bad things starts to happen because this animal is starting to die. It might last 30 years, might last 50 years with enough drugs and you know interventions on the Western side, but you are a dying animal when you live there. 
Anxiety very often manifests on a physiological level. We see people show up at the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack, but that's because on a physiological level they are feeling almost their system vibrating from that anxiety. The heart rate, the breath, the flushed experience, that kind of clammy feeling, that um, numbness that comes up, that is your physiological response to anxiety. And anxiety can feel so completely out of control. What I've also found is that somebody who's experiencing anxiety finds being in their body to feel like torture. I had someone once say she just felt like she wanted to unzip her skin and crawl out. It was just too hard to be in there. Part of what we want to help somebody do is to learn how to self-regulate to regulate that, but of course, there's no, I can't just say to you, just breathe, because that, you'll punch me, you know, right? But the just breathe is not gonna help you. Any, any sentence that starts with just wouldn't help anybody anyways. But if we really kind of tune into where did it start, and what can we start to feel some sense of control over? There is, um, a relaxation technique that was uh, developed by Jacobson, it's called progressive relaxation, where you tense a part of your body and release, and tense and release. And you do it enough that what you're doing is teaching your body that you have control over bringing it in and letting it go. So it, it's really about giving some sense of control. And that's a way that we can start to get some physiological and creative regulation of the anxiety that takes over. A thriving animal is in this place of rest and digest, where the body is doing what it needs to do. The body is making ends meet in a way that isn't robbing Peter to pay Paul. Your adrenals are normalized. Your nervous system is calm. You're coming from your prefrontal cortex. What is that? Negation of impulses, higher moral reasoning, so the guys call and say, hey, uh, we're in town, let's go for a drink. I had plans to go to the gym and have dinner with my family. So if I say yes to the guys, I say no to my, my, my family, my health, and a lot of things. But instinctively, I've had a long day, I need some sort of anesthetic, that sounds like a great idea, I'm just gonna make a bad decision. Cheesecake shows up. I shouldn't eat that thing. I'm starving, I'm gonna eat it now, right? And that goes on and on and on with these, these cascades of bad decisions that come from us living in a wartime economy and never being able to really get out. That is very specifically what Qigong and meditation, mind-body practice can fix. So self-regulation is kind of pop language. People use a lot, but I'm gonna just define it for myself. It is that sense that we feel kind of a sense of autonomy and control over ourselves, our bodies, our brains, our emotions, our reactions. I kind of think like we're always on that continuum. There are times when we have a lot and kind of can look at the brain and there are times when we're in our lower brain and just reacting and then there are times when we can sit, take a moment and make some much more judgment calls, much kind of clearer decision making. And in the same way our body gets activated that way. Think about a time when you're really angry and what happens to your body? It can flare out of control. And then another time when you really do feel like you have full composure. One of the major issues that we're having in modern society is our inability to de-stress. And we understand that there's the parasympathetic nervous system which will put us in that state. And so there is a lot of effort there trying to get us into PNS dominance. Um, there are plenty of studies out there that show very specifically that if you can relax the gastroc muscle, you will go into PNS because when you tighten your gastroc, it, it, it's a sympathetic uh, trigger, right? Like something's coming at me, I need to jump, so your calves. Somehow putting the tip of the tongue to the roof of the mouth triggers PNS dominance. And lower diaphragmatic breathing will also trigger PNS dominance. Uh, you get into a traditional Wu Chi Tai Chi stance, your knees are bent, your gastrocs are released, your tip of the tongue is touching the roof of the mouth, and you're doing lower abdominal breathing. How these guys figure it out, I don't know. But it's right there. Now, 
One of the challenges with that is people say, oh my goodness, like we found it. I tried it during a panic attack and you know, it helped a little. That is not the way these practices work. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So I'm not really interested in teaching someone Tai Chi to replace a Quaalude in the time of crisis. I'm teaching someone Tai Chi to lengthen their fuse so that they can live in that PNS dominance. And even when something goes wrong and, you know, look, tragedy comes, right? Humanity, we have a lot of crisis that comes our way and it's in their teachers, really, right? These, these challenges that come our way, it's how we deal with them. And so if it knocks you off your perch and you can't come back to a rest and digest uh, rational place to say, okay, well, this happened and I'm gonna do this now. I know it sucks, but this is my move. I'm not going to react. Does, are you human or are you an animal? As adults, we forget that we can get back up again. We have to get it right all the time. And I think that is the problem with self-regulation in adults, is we feel that we have to have it all together all the time or we explode. And so people jump from one end to the other rather than allowing themselves to be on this continuum. And to say part of the way we're gonna live in the world is we're gonna fail. And we're gonna allow ourselves to fail so that we will be able to have that beautiful opportunity to get back up again. I would say this with authority 20 years ago before any of these studies came out because I knew within myself, being a lifelong meditator, being a person who's done this practice and watching what it's done to the lives of the people that I've instructed, I could say for sure, definitively, this is what it does. Now the studies are out. NF kappa B, one of the most powerful modulators, gene expression of cytokine release inflammation. We know that practitioners of Qigong and Tai Chi, mind-body practice in general, will modulate. They will reduce the NF-kappa B, which means what? We have lower TNF, tumor necrosis factor. We have lower inflammation. Think about this for a second. Inflammation, everyone talks about being the mother of all disease. Everyone is trying to find a solution to this problem. Now, all these studies are coming out saying, well, look, looks like this mind-body practice actually is the holy grail of all of this and brings down NF-kappa B and modulates inflammation and helps with the immunity and helps the regeneration and the respiration of mitochondria. And there's so many things that we're finding that happen with the modulation and the reduction of NF-kappa B and TNF. And all the drugs out there all the drug companies are trying to find a way to intercept this pathway. And we know that mind-body practice just does it. Costs you nothing, but you gotta do it. You can't put it in a bottle. You can't sell it. It has no intrinsic market value. It's just the fountain of youth. Yet our healthcare system looks away because it, tr it is trying to stay in this profit-driven tumor that will constantly look for uh, secondary tertiary interventions and not try to solve the problems. It's insane. So what is our number one modality for this episode? Well, first I wanna restate that we've arranged the healing solution countdown based on our own internal algorithm that takes into consideration various factors for each solution, such as A, scientific data, B, history of use, like has it been used for 5,000 years by multiple civilizations? That carries some weight. C, how affordable is it? Is money a barrier or is it free? D, how easy is it to apply or learn? And a bunch of other criteria along those lines. The medicines and modalities that make it into our winner circle must check off most, if not all of those boxes in some way. So with that in mind, our favorite number one stress solution tonight is EFT or emotional freedom technique. Some of you might've heard of it, Many of you have not. This personal tool, also known as tapping, is gaining serious traction around the world because of its ease of use, mounting scientific evidence supporting its effectiveness, extremely quick results like you'll often feel better in less than 10 minutes, and oh, it's absolutely free to use and can be done anywhere, anytime. What is EFT exactly and how does it work? Let's find out. More often than not, 
the tendency as human beings is going to be to look for the negative, to be drawn to the things that are going wrong in the world. We are looking for the tiger in the bushes because our ancestor who did not look for the tiger in the bushes got eaten by the tiger in the bushes. We have this built-in response that says, let me identify the negative, the scary, the dangerous in my life in order to stay safe. You know, the body has a way of holding things in the subconscious and holding on to them as a survival technique, really. But really, it can do us a disservice and prevent us from fully healing because our brains are so powerful. When we start looking at some of the fears that we have in our lives, especially as we look as older adults, we tend to look at our lives and go, hmm, I'm scared of public speaking. I'm not taking a risk here. I react quickly in an angry way. I become sad and depressed. I'm full of anxiety. We look at these things, we notice them about ourselves, and then we ask, where did they come from? Is that who I am? Is anxiety who I am? Is anger who I am? Is fear of speaking in public who I am at the core? And what I have seen time and again, and what tapping has shown me so definitively, is that those things are never who we are. Those are the programs, the limitations, the experiences that we had often as children that have been trapped in our bodies, that have fed onto themselves one after the other. So if we think about a fear of public speaking and someone says, yeah, if you told me to speak in public right now, my hands would start sweating, my stomach would hurt, I would just be overwhelmed, it would be a terrible, dangerous situation, going back to that fight or flight response, a dangerous situation to speak in public. How did that happen? Was someone born with that fear of speaking in public? Unlikely. What tends to happen is we have experiences. So that person maybe was in the fifth grade and they got up to speak in front of the class and they're reading a book and they stumbled over a word and everybody laughed because they said it in a funny way or said the wrong word. Even the teacher chuckled a little bit. Not a big moment, not life-changing, not devastating, or is it? Because if we're vulnerable in that space, if we are impressionable and we say, whoa, everyone laughed at me, I feel ashamed, I feel embarrassed, I'm confused, then we decide in that moment, consciously and most importantly unconsciously, that speaking in public isn't safe. The challenge especially happens when these experiences stack on top of each other. So maybe that fifth grade experience was like, well, I don't like speaking in public and I'm anxious. And in seventh grade, there's a book report that I have to give and I have to read it in front of the class again. And I know two months ahead of time that's going to happen. So now I've got two months thinking about what happened last time, worrying about it, stressing. I'm doing a poor job on the report itself because I'm so locked up, my brain is freezing because I have this stress response. I get up in front of the class and I stumble on those words again, or I lock up, or maybe do just a fine job, but don't get the feedback you're expecting and then make decisions about myself. Okay, I'm definitely not a good public, public speaker. I'm definitely gonna stumble over my words. I'm definitely going to be judged and seen and feel whatever we feel in our bodies. Those things start stacking. They go into high school and then they affect our careers. And, you know, public speaking necessarily isn't something a lot of people have to deal with, but certainly standing up, giving a presentation, speaking the truth of how we feel, giving a voice to our own personal experience, feeling confident in our bodies, that's something that we all need. And that's how these events stack up wherever we go. Those are the traumas with the little T's, as we call them. Then we also have big traumas where we actually were unsafe in our childhood, where there was abuse or neglect or an unsafe environment. And now we're looking at everything in the world as unsafe. Now our body is conditioned to be on high alert all the time. Then we have situations like a global pandemic happen. And guess what? You're coming in with that nervous system that is already sky high, working fast, already anxious, already overwhelmed. And that's when it just takes it over the edge. So I first discovered tapping right around 2003. Uh, I was actually at a Tony Robbins event. He did a short demonstration of this tapping procedure, came up on stage and said, 
You know, when you tap on these endpoints of meridians of your body, you can use it to calm your body down to release stress and anxiety and overwhelm. So what are the meridians in Chinese medicine? They are their pathways in which qi flows. Qi is our energy, our life force. As a Chinese medicine practitioner, qi is everything. It's the basis of our medicine. A simple um, statement in Chinese medicine, when there's pain, there's a blockage of qi, and then you know, when, the, when there's a flow of qi, then there's no pain. Those meridians are pathways that connect all of the organs, giving them qi flow. What the latest research is showing is that when we tap on these endpoints of meridians of our body, while focusing on the stress, the anxiety, the pain, whatever's in the way, we're sending a calming signal to the amygdala in the brain. And the amygdala, as a lot of people know, is that fight, flight, or freeze response center in our brain. When we're angry about something, when we get an email that is overwhelming, that is scary, when we see the news, when someone says something to us that sets us off, it's that amygdala that's firing in the brain. And the tapping, and we're getting more research about it every day, seems to be sending a counteracting signal, which is why we sometimes tap while focusing on what's wrong. For example, if we have a fear of public speaking, we imagine doing that. The second we close our eyes and we imagine speaking in front of thousands, if that fear is part of our body, that amygdala starts firing. The fear response just from that imagination starts happening. And then we use the tapping to counteract that fear response to send that calming signal, which is why we see that people can move through things so quickly. Things that have scared them in the past, things that have kept them stuck in the past, when we turn off that brain response, that's when our lives can really change. So let's have an experience with tapping. It's one of the most powerful parts of it that you can say, wait, why are we tapping on these endpoints of meridians? But if you take just a couple minutes, you can see something shift in your body. So with tapping, we always start on what we're working on. If you're anxious about something right now, focus on that. If you have physical pain in your body, the tapping can often unlock it, release some of that tension so you could focus on that physical pain. If you're overwhelmed by everything that's happening in the world, put the focus there. We want to try to be specific. so. If you're anxious about work, you go, okay, I'm gonna pick that specific thing. If you have pain in your body, pick a specific spot that you have pain. Just go ahead and take a moment to do that. So pick one thing that you wanna move past, that you wanna release, that you wanna let go of. And as you tune into it, give it a number on a scale of zero to 10. So if we're looking at anxiety, 10 would be the most anxious you could feel. If you're angry at something, you might say, it's an eight, I'm so angry. If you have physical pain, pretty easy to rate it, just give it a number. So we have our target, the thing that we're focused on, we have our number, and then we'll start doing the tapping. We start by tapping on the side of the hand, it's called the karate chop point. Whatever hand feels comfortable for you. Now I'm gonna use very general language, you'll find that it applies, and repeat after me, either in your mind or out loud. So tapping on the side of the hand, you can close your eyes if it's safe to do so. And just say, even though I have this stress in my body, I choose to relax and feel safe now. And we're gonna do that two more times on the side of the hand. Even though I'm holding on so tight, there's so much going on. And with all these feelings, I accept myself now. We're gonna do that one more time. You're staying on the side of the hand. Even though I'm holding on to all this stress, I accept myself now. Now we'll tap through the points. The first point is the eyebrow point. Inside of the eyebrow, right where the hair ends and it meets the nose, you can use two fingers of one hand the other hand or both hands, the meridians run down both sides of the body. And as you tap gently, I want you to just think about your issue. So if you're anxious, just ask yourself, what am I anxious about? If you have pain in your body, put your attention in that place now. 
we move to the side of the eye. It's not on the temple, right next to the eye, on the bone. Again, one side or both sides. You're tapping gently. You're putting that focus on your challenge. If you're stressed about something that's happening tomorrow, think about it now. Under the eye, right on the bone. We are giving this a voice. We are tuning in in order to send that calming signal to the amygdala. What are you stressed about? What are you angry about? What are you holding on to so tight? Under the nose, tapping gently, breathing gently, feeling present to anything that comes up. Under the mouth, it's above the chin, below the lip, and that little crease there. If your mind wanders, that's okay. Just bring it back to the thing that you want to release. The anxiety, the stress, the pain, the overwhelm. For the collarbone point, just feel for the two little bones of the collarbone. You want to go right below them. You can tap with all ten fingers of both hands. You're tapping gently. Bring your attention back to that stressor. Two points left underneath the arm. It's three inches underneath the armpit, right on the bra line for women. Put your attention on that stress or anxiety. And the last point, right at the top of the head, feeling present, safe, and grounded. Now let's do one more round. If you can, close your eyes for this round. We go back to the eyebrow. Repeat after me, either in your mind or out loud. It's safe to let this go. Side of the eye. It's safe to release this stress. Under the eye. I choose to feel safe now. Under the nose, letting go. Under the mouth, I am safe. Collarbone, letting go. Under the arm, from every cell in my body. Top of the head, right now. And you can gently stop tapping and take a breath in and let it go. And now we tune back in. So that was two very quick rounds, very general rounds, but we tune back into that pain, that anxiety, the thing that you measured in the beginning. Go ahead and do that now. And you might say, well, the pain was at an eight, but now it's a seven or a six or a five. I felt really anxious in my heart, but it seemed to release and I can breathe better. I was angry about something, but then something else came up. I wasn't even thinking about. The tapping process is this beautiful dance. We can do it for as short as those two minutes and just let go in the middle of our days, or we can keep unwinding it, go deeper, and let go from there. What have we learned? Okay, we covered a lot of territory in this episode. To start, our number five modality, remember, we go in reverse order in a countdown format, was yoga. When it comes to stress, yoga has some of the best science supporting its clinical efficacy. As Dr. Sapi reminded us, our thoughts are not us. No need to react to or engage them. This is an understanding developed with yogic practice. Yoga features movement and breath regulation, both of which work on the autonomic nervous system, bringing us into a meditative state and down-regulating the stress response. Today, all first-year Harvard medical students get yoga training as a form of self-care and stress management. We then moved on to herbal medicine and nutritional supplementation. David Winston told us about stimulating adaptogens like rhodiola and Asian ginseng, as well as calming adaptogens like ashwagandha. Then, Tara guided us into the world of functional mushrooms, focusing specifically on the cherished reishi mushroom, hailed throughout the millennia for its adaptogenic effects on the body, meaning it contains compounds that help your body adapt to external and internal stressors. When it comes to overcoming stress and balancing mood, this medicinal fungi is definitely one to look into. We then moved on to mindfulness, and if you need science on the benefits of this form of present moment attentiveness, there is plenty of it. Dr. Itai shared that mindfulness is now infused into major corporations, government agencies, and healthcare centers. It's pretty much everywhere. Cultivating the ability to pause and decide on a healthy behavior creates control, self-regulation, and enhances stress management. 
Meditation, a form of mindfulness, releases a ton of neurotransmitters, creating a bliss cocktail of serotonin and endorphins. And how about accessing eternal wisdom? Sounds good, right? And all you need to do is sit and reflect inward. Next, we explored the ancient traditions of Tai Chi and Qigong. Dr. Shojai spoke to the practice of coordinating the eyes, mind, body, and breath in order to move out of the stress cycle and into parasympathetic dominance, which is your rest and digest mode more readily. We wrapped up this episode with an exploration of EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. This powerful personal practice is extremely effective at reducing stress as well as chronic pain, hidden traumas, and other limiting aspects within us. Nick Ortner, the leading voice behind EFT, who has brought this technique to the masses, took us through a quick exercise that you can try right now to experience the immediate mental benefits that tapping can bring you. Whew, we covered a lot in this first episode. I hope you got one or two healing gems that really stuck with you. Okay, lastly, what alternative healing secrets do we have coming up next? Tomorrow night, we air episode two, and this one is a two-parter. Part one focuses on powerful ways to boost and balance your immune system and also heal autoimmune disorders. The second area we'll be focusing on tomorrow is your gut health and overall microbiome. In other words, the trillions of microorganisms that live in and on our bodies. This one's going to be truly enlightening. Make sure to tune in. See you tomorrow.